Hi, this is Harold in China. I am now in Shanghai, here for work. Actually, I'm outside, so let me take off the mask. Uh, I'm here for work, so uh, I didn't have time to look at much of Shanghai. I took a short, uh, quick shot of the famous Shanghai skyline from a taxi. <laughs> That's about it. I hope I'll find some time later on. But um, today I want to talk about something different because obviously there have been very important and quite dangerous developments uh, around uh, the island of Taiwan. As you all know, the US Speaker of the House, Pelosi, has landed on Taiwan yesterday evening. And um, it was celebrated in Western media as now they showed the Chinese and uh, but it makes you wonder like okay so they've showed the chinese what they've showed the chinese that they can still laugh in their face that they can disrespect them they can visit uh, the island of taiwan which the u.s themselves acknowledge is part of china and uh, china can do nothing about it but what's the value beside the photo op and that's the thing with the u.s they always think like once we've done the photo op the things end and that's it. Well, it's not. Yes, China didn't shoot down the plane of Pelosi. And yes, in Chinese social media, there was a lot of disappointment, a lot of anger. Like, why didn't our government do anything? Why didn't we stop her? Uh, but what China actually did is minutes after Pelosi landed, after there's proof, yes, she did go there and not just say she would and rumors and stuff. Minutes after that happened, they announced military drills all around Taiwan. And these military drills are of a scale that has never been seen before. Uh, you know, uh, they, they are all around Taiwan. Politico calls it an alarming strategic uh, uh, prospect uh, with another crisis. And the thing with, with drills, okay, you can say, well, it's just military drills. They're just doing a show of force. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, remember how the war in Ukraine started that was just military drills it was all around Ukraine and uh, the Russians said like no nah, it's just drills we're not planning to invade uh, in this case I don't expect China to uh, attack from those positions although these are excellent positions if they want to attack all of Taiwan from all sides but the thing is once they set the precedent they've done these drills they can do them anytime again and say well look we've done this before nothing new like why are you excited about it and once such drills become regular they of course become the perfect launching pads to whenever china feels they're ready to attack uh, they they can and so i would by no means underestimate uh, what these drills mean and yes china has sailed some ships in the open pacific before but never have they had live fire drills in the waters of the island of taiwan never have they had uh, live fire drills all around taiwan at the same time and we'll see how large they are in scale uh, and the initial announcement by xinhua uh, said the drills will be on august 4th after pelosi left now the word is that tonight they will already start meaning it could be that uh, China closes part of the airspace through which uh, Pelosi has to leave. The question is how the US will respond. And obviously now this is the response. So the US did this uh, kind of what you're going to do about it uh, move when they s let Pelosi. I'm not going to send her, I'm going to say send her, but basically they let her go to Taiwan. and. Uh, China said on the face of it, well, we threaten you, we tell you you shouldn't do it, but let's see if you really do it. Now they say, okay, we've done it. Next, we're going to send a huge uh, military drill uh, in your way. And you said you commit to whatever of Taiwan. Uh, now show us how you commit. And it's now it's kind of China saying, I dare you. Just shoot down one of our planes, shoot down or sink one of our ships. And then you have your war, but then we can say you started it. And um, it, yeah, we don't know how the US will respond. We don't know how Taiwan will respond. And people have asked me, like, why do they attack Taiwan? The problem is the US. Yes, of course, but there's two points. Uh, one, strip the US of all its, its allies and friends and bases around the world. And the US is a harmless country on the other side of a big ocean. And the other one is 
to to defer other countries from cooperating with the US. I mean, every sane political leader sees what happens to Ukraine. So <laughs> you'd think nobody would voluntarily work with the US again, because obviously the US is very good at getting people into trouble, but <laughs> really bad at getting people out of it. So, so you'd think nobody wants to work with the US that has not um, proven true in practice. So at least those authorities in Taiwan that currently are in power they still feel it's beneficial for them personally to work with us and so china just shows the whole region vietnam philippines see what happens if you think the us will help you so they visit you they make provocations they use you to provoke china to humiliate china and then you're the one that suffers so think twice before you help them make you suffer there's a little pond next to the bridge with some quite uh, beautiful water flowers. I don't even know what they are. Some purple flowers. Not sure if you can see them from a distance. Um, so yeah, th this is uh, the situation. And, and about the, the general mood in China. So some people have said like, oh, China's already, you know, very upset. There's bank runs because of, of, of banks going bust and then the whole botched COVID response. So the there's massive unrest in the population they just wait for a trigger and i think that might have been the uh, assessment in the us if they believe their own propaganda that they really think like now all it needs is a little trigger like showing that china cannot do anything if we uh, go to taiwan but um i totally disagree so the thing is first those bank runs as i've done a video about that was a very local very small branch of a, of, a, of a village uh, bank has nothing to do with the big cities has nothing to do with 99% of uh, banking assets it's a very small and containable crisis and the second uh, issue the the, Shang, the botched allegedly botched covid response yes shanghainese were very angry especially angry at getting lied to regarding how long the lockdown would be and I think a lot of people even outside of Shanghai were, were kind of surprised, kind of shocked that this happens, especially in Shanghai, because they always felt Shanghai is the most advanced, the most like, um, human governance advanced city. So they didn't expect that. But that doesn't mean that it affected them. Like I've been in Beijing during the Shanghai lockdown and I didn't have any problems. I had a phase where we had to do daily tests, COVID tests. COVID tests were all for free. They happened right outside my compound. So I get out my house, I walk through a park at five minutes and then I'm at the COVID test station. Doesn't cost me anything, it takes me 10 minutes. I would work from home because the office was closed and that's it. Like the shops were open, restaurants could uh, do home delivery. So my quality of life was hardly impacted. And after a month, everything was over and now I live in a non-COVID country again. And same in Shanghai, I mean, yes, people were angry. And I think that anger still lingers. Some people in Shanghai still have trauma. And I think it's serious and people should take it serious. But Shanghai has a population of about 30 million in a country of 1.4 billion. So don't overestimate Shanghai's important. It's important as a light tower. It's important for the economy. It's uh, one of the richest city on the mainland. And so, yes, it's important. And yes, that was a problem. And yes, there were mistakes made in Shanghai, but it's nowhere near a nationwide uprising. That's just so far fetched. So, uh, yeah, that's why I think the whole mood overall was grossly misjudged by people who think, um, uh, you know, the Chinese society was unstable. If I look to Europe or the US, the types of protests that happened, the violence of the protests, I'd much rather say that Europe and the US are unstable versus China. Uh, and I'm not saying that they are, I'm just saying they're much more unstable than China. So uh, I, I'm first of all, not worried about that. And second of all, the thing is, if you don't have national elections every four years, you don't need to go for the photo op politics. The Chinese can really work strategically and the Chinese government has the further benefit that they have a generally very well-educated population. So, you know, like Chinese aren't typically 
just watching soaps and drinking beer every evening. Um, China has a very, very strong book culture. People like reading. It doesn't have to be paper books. There's all kinds of apps where you can, even for free or for like a few dollars per month, read books on your cell phone. People read books in the subway. Uh, so reading is everywhere. And even more importantly, China has an education culture. Throughout history, throughout Chinese feudalism for, for thousands of years, uh, education, learning, reading was the way to get into, into noble, uh, how do you call it? Like to become a nobleman, to, to get into government, to get uh, the power of a feudal lord. So unlike European feudalism, where it's all inherited, China did have a, a dynastic class which inherited power, but the real power rested with the literati, with the guys who went through education, do an exam, and by that became governors and, and high-level leaders of the state. So education has always been the way to power and glory in Chinese culture. And, you know, you cannot just extinguish the deep-seated values of a society. So education is definitely a value in the Chinese society that transcends, that even goes to, you know, farmers, truck drivers, people who themselves don't have any education. They all know that their children should have education, that it would be good to have education and that they should work hard to get at least some education. And I think that's a huge difference to the West, to be honest, where at least in recent years, it's not always been like that in the West, but in recent years, I feel there's a growing anti-intellectualism movement where politicians always emphasize that they're not intellectuals. They emphasize that they're like normal people and by normal people they mean like dumb idiots basically. <laughs> so that's, that's a, a strong difference in China. And if you have a highly educated population that's willing to listen to people who know more, who have a higher education and have more insights into, you know, like the, the secret parts of politics and national security, then you can tell them, like, yes, we're doing these drills now. They show that we can do whatever we want around Taiwan, not just sending some old politician, 82-year-old, but actually sending our military into the territorial waters of Taiwan. So that shows that we actually do have the sovereignty to do whatever we want. But then we don't have to attack now because it's not in our interest right now to fight the war. We have economic challenges. We have a, a renewal of leadership coming up in fall. We have the crisis in Ukraine, which hurts supply chains. We have the whole economic challenges in Europe and the US, which are important export markets for, for China. So there's all these reasons why China should not want a war right now. And then you have, of course, uh, the famous Sun Tzu Bing Fa, the, the uh, what's it called? The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Um, which has a, a statement that's so perfect for your situation, saying, if it doesn't benefit, you don't attack. If there's no existential crisis, you don't want a war. So, right now, it's not in the interest of China. And it even goes on to say, you know, human, uh, or like uh, desperation, sadness, unhappiness can be turned into happiness, but a destroyed country can never return. If the country is gone, it's never going to come back and dead people can never be reborn. So, very clearly, this statement, thousands of years old as it is, tells the Chinese in, in one simple sentence, in a very authoritative language of being the famous art of war, uh, that you shouldn't let emotions guide your response to provocations, and you shouldn't take military um, strategies lightly. And I think these like combination of an educated population and, and a historic culture uh, that includes this this art of war helps the Chinese government very easily to just guide according to the national interests of China rather than some emotion of the public. And with that, I don't want to get too long. Also, I've arrived at my office, so um, I'm going to end it here. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and forward.